Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast brought to you by Bangalore International Center, where we present conversations that move, inform, and encourage discourse. There's no finality to such human tragedies. The consequence of human tragedies, supposing it brought about genetic changes in the structure of the human genome, to ignore it as something which is legally concluded is the most uncivilized way of thinking. There's no finality to injustice. They are open-ended things. They are civilizational issues. They are not inter-party disputes of a litigation nature. They are not merely they are civilizational obligations of uh, humanism and uh, my goodness, how to treat it as a case. This is a matter of international concern. The matter of international concern. Welcome to None Wiser Than the Law, a series of conversations with Justice M. N. Venkta Chalaya covering the law, his life, politics, and the constitution. The title of this podcast comes from Aristotle, who said to seek to be wiser than the law is the very thing which is by good laws forbidden. The role of a judge is therefore not to presume wisdom, but to unearth the wisdom of the law. Justice Vinkta Chalaya quotes this aphorism in a judgment, and in this series, we explore his judicial philosophy that shaped India's jurisprudence. My name is Alok Prasanna Kumar and I'm a co-founder of the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy. I had a chance to speak to former Chief Justice of India MN Venkta Chalaya in August 2023. In our conversation, we covered a range of topics from his beginnings as a lawyer to his tenure as a Supreme Court judge, his landmark judgments and his views on developments in law and society. In this episode of the series, we look at two judgments concerning two of the most traumatic incidents in independent India's history. The Bhopal gas disaster in 1984 and the demolition of the Babri Masjid in 1991. Both these incidents gave rise to multiple cases in the courts, including cases that came up to the Supreme Court and featured Justice Venkta Chalaya on the bench. Namely, Union Carbide Corporation vs Union of India decided in 1991 and Dr. Ismail Farooqi vs. Union of India decided in 1994. The Supreme Court's role in the settlement between the Union of India and Union Carbide has been much debated, as was its role in the eventual closure of the Babri Masjid dispute. In this episode, we discuss reasons behind the court's rulings. But first, a little context. On the night of December 2nd and 3rd, 1984, Approximately 30 tons of the deadly methyl isocyanate gas stored in US multinational Union Carbide's plant in Bhopal escaped into the atmosphere. The noxious fumes killed thousands, seriously harmed tens of thousands more, and lakhs continued to suffer the ill effects of that night. Soon after the incident, civil cases seeking compensation on behalf of the victims were filed in courts in India and the USA. Very soon, it became apparent that no court had tackled a civil case of this magnitude. In March 1985, Parliament passed the Bhopal Gas Leak Disaster Processing of Claims Act 1985, which gave to the Indian government the sole authority to pursue all civil claims on behalf of the victims of the tragedy. This it did by invoking the principle of parents patrie, a principle that dates back to Roman law where the government is supposed to act as the parent for those without a parent, that is, in a protective manner and taking up the cause of those who cannot take it up themselves. The Union government first approached courts in the United States but were rebuffed. US courts held that the US was not the place to pursue this claim even though Union Carbide's headquarters were in the US and that courts in India would be better suited for this purpose. When the trial eventually began in a Bhopal court, the first issue that the court was called to decide was the interim compensation Union Carbide ought to pay. This compensation was needed given the vast number of people affected by the gas leak, but also the difficulty in completing the trial quickly. The trial court fixed Rs 250 crore 
as the interim compensation payable by Union Carbide. When Union Carbide challenged this in the Madhya Pradesh High Court, the interim compensation payable was increased to Rs 350 crore. When Union Carbide filed an appeal, the Supreme Court urged the parties to arrive at a final settlement rather than debate interim compensation alone and prolong the case. In 1989, a settlement was reached between the Union Government and Union Carbide for $470 million or Rs 750 crore as full and final settlement of all claims, civil and criminal. This settlement received a stamp of approval from the court in an order that provoked much criticism. In this conversation, we begin by asking Justice Venkatachalaya what he thought about the settlement. Basically, the factual thing was that government wanted $500 million. It was government will just stand itself. Supposing we said no, we will fight it out. And ultimately, the decree was not domesticated in America. Who is answerable to it? Who is answerable to it? It will be the government and the courts, I assume. And uh, what we said was perhaps one thing was missed is if the compensation that has been agreed to is insufficient, government of India must bear the burden. That's how we cleared our conscience saying, that are we approving something? Which, Secondly, could we have put this idea into the scales, was it within our uh, concern, whether the decree would ultimately be domesticated in America? That's a question whether we are concerned with it or not. Whether that decree that we are going to approve is going to be domesticated for enforcement in, in America or not, is it a legitimate concern for us to take into account when we approve the settlement or not? It's a very difficult question. And secondly, there were cases in which possibly, if I am, if my memory serves right, American court declined to domesticate a decree outside because the language is a court. And in India, they openly declared, I don't know at whose instance the court proceedings will be Hindi, so the large number of people will understand it. There's a language which is not understood by the defendant. Was it a germ of self-destruction that was there unconsciously, somebody got into it. Secondly, there's a case, uh, cases in which the, the lawyers were hindered in the trial. There's a person for contempt, punishing contempt, not even for, uh, for contempt. Was it a gem of self-destruction for the future uh, enforceable? Say the, these are whether it was legitimate for us to put it into the scales at all in approving the settlement. We have our reservations about it. Whether we go by the and one thing which I insisted, and the, my colleagues in the bench agreed, in spite of the government to understand, that the account must be kept in a dollar account till the dispute was finally settled. Government to India said, no, we can't do that. We said, it's a judicial order, we have to do it. Lo and behold, within six months, the 16 rupees became 32 rupees per dollar. We got, in terms of rupee, twice the money. Even the tasty money might have not have been sufficient, but these are some of the cautious uh, steps that we ensured. And it, how to say, supposing you had a decree for a thousand million, for a billion dollars, how are you sure it would be domesticated in America? We had no means of saying that, nor was it uh, the concern at that stake. This is something that. Uh... I mean, I had the privilege of being taught by Professor Vepa Sarathi in, uh, uh, when I was in law school. And uh, I remember in his lectures, he pointed this out. And uh, one part of this, I guess, uh, uh, story that... I suspect, I am not sure, I don't have material to say, that uh, Mr. Parashan might have consulted the top thought lawyer outside India in evaluating that potential possibility. I don't know. Uh, because we know that the government of India approached the U.S. courts. The government of India approached the U.S. courts to try and ensure that the suit for damages was filed there. But the U.S. court said that because of foreign non-convenience.
I think there was worry. And I think you fairly point that out that there was worry that even if we say more, that it might not be enforceable outside uh, India. And uh, what, what I sort of wanted to ask was that, did you leave it to the government and the union carbide? You come up with a number and whatever you come up with will be okay or? The government of India itself, if I remember right, I'm not very sure, it's almost uh, 30 years ago. Government of India wanted 500 million. They were prepared to give them six months' time. If you counted down the six months' uh, yield, it would come to 470 million. Uh, that was paid immediately. And we ensured that it was kept in a dollar account. And within six months, the rupee was devalued and became 32 for a dollar. At the time of settlement, it was 16. In that sense, the terms of the settlement, at least the monetary aspect of it, that was keeping in mind that a large number may look good on paper, but may not be enforceable. Quite right. But whether we could have officially taken note of it was a, a moot point. That it was in the background of our minds can't be denied, but we didn't assume that any decree by a civilized court would be domesticated in another civilized country. And this is, I suppose, something which today, when we see that litigation happens all around the world, is enforced in India, and Indian litigation is enforced elsewhere. Was there a reason, was there a specific kind of case that perhaps you worried that a direct decree in India may not be enforceable outside India? Unconsciously, we looked into a couple of cases, I think. My, myself looked into some of the cases, but uh, in the procedure, we didn't want to put in, the, because it was between two parties. And there was a document that one of our uh, eminent uh, legal men had suggested 110 million. He had written to government of India for, he uh, must exist for this thing. And he was a great critic of this settlement. The government had taken up the claims on behalf of uh, the individuals who had suffered. The principle of parents patriae, there was that legislation which was passed consolidating all the claims. Did you feel the government had done a good enough job in representing the victims in this case? Good enough. Not the best, perhaps. What would you say would have been the best? Why did they stumble upon 500 million? Legally, they presented, in fact, the case law and the notes that they prepared in those volumes could be a asset to any library, law school library. Okay, then I must ask Mr. Parasaran then for this. Yes, yes, yes. Beautiful thing. In fact, I told them just offhand in court how in the flowering season, a gentleman sprayed pesticide on uh, the flowers. Millions of bees came from outside and they sat and died. He said they're trespassing bees. Beautiful judgment to the English courts. I mentioned that within five minutes, perhaps and team, I think there's one boy who was assisting who became judge of the high court. He, within five minutes, he picked up this case and gave it to me. The English court which said, amongst bees, there's no trespassing bees. And the millions of bees died as a result of, uh, then they made a rule that they should not spray in the flowering season pesticides on the plants. That's right. And, uh... Was it that they started with too low a number, that the union government, they might have started with a higher number in your view? Might have. Whether they used their bargaining power up to the potential or not, I am not the judge. But looking back, they could have... See, there's an old story. There's a man who had a horse in the roadside and put a horse for sale. And the horse was next to him tied up to a peg. Somebody came and asked him, I want to buy this house. What's the price you want? $1,000. He said, I don't think I'll give you 50 bucks. He said, take it. He said, you asked for $1,000 and now you're selling for 50. He said, maybe I thought you wanted a $1,000 horse. You see, see the subtlety of that. Maybe I thought you wanted a $1,000 horse. Why should I come in the way? Uh, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. And uh, one sort of last point that I kind of want to address here we see that uh, Indian lawyers, they face some criticism in this case. Specifically, I want to talk about uh, Mr. Nani Palkiwala's affidavit in uh, the US court, which said Indian courts are too slow. They will not be able to dispose of this uh, case anytime soon. They are too overburdened. I remember this was one of the very first things that we studied in law school, in the law of torts, Mr. Nani Palkiwala's affidavit, and I think Mr. Gallanter's counter affidavit on this point. 
how was it received that perhaps the most well known indian lawyer has gone and said this about our courts in another country it was obviously against the interest of that company union carbide it may not look patriotic but you can't rule out it being realistic and uh, palkewala was such a brilliant legal mind that he would have taken all aspects into consideration unlike the judges who, who might perhaps as a professional uh, for a fee given opinion palkewala would never do that was there a feeling in the courts and in the bar that uh, how could he have said this especially when such a, a disaster has taken place in this country and he should be on our side so to speak what what in that brilliant mind i can't speculate but i'm sure he had very valid reasons to say that because ultimately american court standards of compensation would be much more liberal and higher than what indian courts could be expected to to assess you know that again in 1991 he said indian supreme court has got to such a mess that it will take 300 years to cleanse it economist of uh, london wrote a scathing indictment of the indian supreme court we also have uh, mr fali nariman who appeared for union carbide and uh, he did receive a lot of criticism in the public saying that again you know the same very similar grounds but how do you think he did his professional duty in this circumstance you know people who make criticism of uh, lawyers appearing in conflicting cases don't understand the philosophy of the profession rights of man the author was prosecuted no lawyer was prepared to appear for him for fear of retaliation the then attorney general as kind wrote to the king he was a great friend of the king that the day a lawyer declines to appear for a client in a court he generally practices in at the end of the liberties of citizens in england he resigned and defended him that's the ethos of the profession and you can't blame a lawyer for accepting a brief because somebody must appear now there is uh, sometimes when a very cruel crime occurs there is a sentiment that nobody should defend him and that's is that the end of the professional ethics of the country no that's that's right and i think uh... in that sense uh, did you sort of see mr uh, nariman kind of have to deal with this criticism did he just like be fine with it or do you sense it might have affected him in any way i am sure he would have taken all this into consideration before he accepted it and accepted it after being satisfied that it was not in violation of any rule or ethics of practice and uh, it's good that he appeared for that case because court court trust to uh, good assistance and that's that's an important point because i think that would go to show that here is a country where the legal profession is strictly bound by professional ethics and professional courtesy in this matter right 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 i remember the, the old blitz case i think it was uh, in bombay high court the famous alabad uh, lawyer he appeared the great great case great lawyer Finally, we've seen that uh, that wasn't the closure of the case. I mean, maybe the court had intended it, but almost immediately there was controversy over the fact that the criminal aspect of the case was also settled in this manner. Was that something the judges debated? Was that something that uh, you considered should we allow for this or not? Now I'm talking about the initial uh, judgment where the settlement. Was. I don't remember. Maybe we thought that uh, personal element of criminality, uh, the chairman of the company. was uh, prime facie not established because in fact it says actually of an all sides manufacturing a disastrous chemical of that kind and storing it is not uh, strict liability is absolute liability so it says of absolute liability and then how did the administration allow people to put a shanty thing along the side of the walls of this thing and secondly the moment the gas leak there's a spray of moisture water it will neutralize it one sure way was to put a wet towel on your face the chemical would immediately convert itself to a less lethal chemical and i guess uh, now that we know more about uh, what happened in uh, bhopal we know where the failures were we know that it wasn't just the case of of course union carbide was absolutely liable for it 
but now we know more about the governmental failures about it recently the issue has come back to courts and uh, this is where the government is asking for more money did you feel the government was justified in this there's no finality to such human tragedies the consequence of human tragedies supposing it brought about genetic changes in the structure of the human genome to ignore it as something which is uh, legally concluded is the most uncivilized way of thinking it there is no finality to injustice no because one of the things that uh, you pointed out with the judgment was that you had said any further payment of claims will be made by the government do you think it was fair for the government to say no we won't now take the responsibility union carbide pay more or whoever the dow corporation which now owns union carbide you pay more they are open ended things they are civilizational issues they are not uh, interparty disputes of a uh, litigation nature they are not mere litig they are civilizational obligations of uh, humanism and uh, my goodness how to treat it as a case this is a matter of international concern the matter uh, of international concern and 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 you feel that uh, dow corporation which now owns union carbide do you think they should have given more they should have taken more responsibility courts is a prosperous uh, industrial uh, establishment they were a mass of humanity this kind of acknowledgement of what has happened all other things are the consequences a moral uh, acknowledgement of uh, this disaster may have financial implications it may have other uh, implications but that is a, a civilizational commitment criminal charges against union carbide and its officials were later revived by the supreme court and resulted in the conviction of certain employees and personnel though the settlement was supposed to be full and final and the union of india was supposed to make up for any shortfall an effort was made in 2011 to reopen the settlement seeking more money from dow chemicals the company which had since bought union carbide on the grounds that the amount was inadequate however in 2023 a five judge bench of the supreme court rejected this plea as well The next case we discussed with Justice Venkata Chalaya was Ismail Farooqi versus Union of India. As the Ram Janmabhoomi movement was picking up pace and lakhs of car sevaks descended on Ayodhya, the Babri Masjid, a disputed 16th century mosque, was under threat. Even though a Supreme Court bench headed by Justice Venkata Chalaya had received a solemn assurance from the Uttar Pradesh government that all measures would be taken to protect the mosque, on 6th December 1991, In full view of the media, the Babri Masjid was demolished by a mob of car sevaks. The aftermath of the demolition sparked widespread condemnation and prompted action on the part of the government. Although the origin of the dispute was a civil case claiming the land on which the Babri Masjid stood, the Union government passed the acquisition of certain area at Ayodhya Act 1993 to acquire all the land on which the Babri Masjid had once stood. Separately, the President of India, in exercise of the power under Article 143, referred a series of questions to the Supreme Court of India, effectively asking it to decide whether there was a Hindu temple under the ruins of the Babri Masjid. A constitution bench of the Supreme Court, headed by then CJI Venkata Chalaya, heard the constitutional challenge to the law and the reference together. In its judgment, the Supreme Court struck down the law but surprisingly refused to answer the reference made to it by the president this was the first time and still remains the only time when the supreme court refused to answer a presidential reference we spoke to justice venkata chalaya about why the reference was rejected to say that you can't have a political solution to a legal issue the converse of amirinisa they were not able to find out the heirs of a particular zamindar nobleman in hyderabad the perhaps number of wives and number of children who were the heirs was disputed a mess they made a registration and then said in the schedule the names mentioned the schedule must be deemed to the heirs of so and so that is a judicial matter it is not a legislative matter and they just struck down i think in 1953 what is essentially a judicial function can be taken over by legislative judgment of a, for a judicial dispute and uh, you remember that uh, the name is amir nisa was there a sense that uh, what was being asked of the judiciary at that time 
was too much that this was something that uh, it had to be for the political class to address we give reasons why we don't entertain the decline to answer this question they wanted to put a political decision into the lap of the court you see that decision we said is a temporary receivership the order that the government to decision that they made was a what will the amount of receiver is holding in, in media till the matter was settled by court and i want to take the context a little bit prior because there was the large scale rath yatra which the bjp and led by mr lk adwani was taking place in the 80s it did culminate in the demolition of the babri masjid the matter was in the supreme court at that time and uh, we know that uh, the government had given an undertaking that we will ensure that nothing happens to it but eventually the government failed what was your sense of what do you think happened why do you think that uh, didn't work as intended large political issues communal issues a large conflicts are not amenable easily amenable to judicial discourse in fact there's a recent um, small booklet an american judge came out with he says how the chief justice of islamic country asked why people obey the supreme court of the united states why is it that people obey the court and i think uh, one judge wrote a small book there are some questions which uh, should be their own must take the bear the cross and answer you can't uh, no slid the the court to say something which uh, the legislature or the executive want but i also sort of want to ask at what was your perception of how the government handled the matter legally i'm not talking about the law and order issue i'm talking about legally immediately after the babri masjid demolition and you had the places of worship act which was passed you had uh, this reference made do you think they took the right approach at least post the demolition that in keeping the partly some assuaging moves were made so that it wouldn't tear the fabric of indian society not that the claim of either party is emotional and there is a lot of sentiment attached to it some pretended some real these are all problems which are difficult to contemplate but you said only partly i said what what do you think the government could have done at that point of time they were allowed the suit to go on as speedily as possible and then uh, the suits were pending for <laughs> yes started in 1949 and 61 some collector is alleged to have put a idol there or some such thing that went down and ultimately but it must be said to the credit of supreme court a sharp political issue was decided by 10 judges unanimously oh, sorry you are talking about the supreme court constitution bench judgment uh, which was delivered in 2019 it's a very beautiful research document it's a thousand pages the amount the size of the thing itself is a little difficult to follow but uh, i read every page of it and uh, a very painstaking uh, uh, that's all we'll come to that in a bit but just to come back to mohammed ismail farooqi among your colleagues did they share your sentiment that let us not take up this issue or did you feel that there were those who wanted to answer that question the post to them in the reference not exactly but there is some difference uh, about uh, the way in which the interim solution should be fashioned what should be the interim solution on that there is some kind of debate some kind of concern that uh, should anything you done in the meanwhile should not foreclose the final event and do you think it was possible say that uh, some sort of a final political solution could have been found in that few years in the 1990s itself quite possible and it was quite desirable also so coming to the 2019 uh, judgment which the supreme court finally in some senses put a closure to the at least the title to the property where the babri masjid stood in the sense do you see it as good legal judgment or as a larger justice kind of judgment a larger justice kind of uh, solution desirable to have a peaceful uh, closure than uh, agitated legal strictly legal battle 
Nobody can say that uh, there is sharp adjudicable uh, issues with the definite contours. It's all intertwining with each other. It's something like the Quebec secession case. Judgment can be a reflection of the larger consensus than imposing a consensus. You recognize and acknowledge their consensus, both the law and the facts. It's a unique exercise, whether it's strictly judicial work or something under the Indian Constitution. The Supreme Court is in a very, very special position of uh, trying to resolve matters which are beyond one's comprehension. This is why I want to compare the two judgments across, well, 19, not more than 25 years. In Ismail Faroqi, the bench headed by you said, we don't want this. We don't want this to be our problem to address. But in 2019, context is slightly different. But in terms of, would you say these approaches with... In terms approaches, of judicial values, there's a departure between the two, uh, two attitudes. There's some distinction between the judicial attitudes manifest in the two cases. So in that sense, in the way in which the court addressed the claims of the Hindu parties and the Muslim parties... I suppose one criticism that has come forth is that strict legal standards were perhaps not fully applied, that a larger role seems to have been given to sentiments of parties about this. Was that your assessment also? The core of the whole thing was sentimental. The court did not create a sentiment. It was faced with a sentiment. And it had to do whatever best that can be done under the circumstances. The court had contrived a sentiment and tried to demolish it. Their sentiment was a fait accompli. That's an interesting uh, point. And I think that sort of gets to the heart of the difficult task that the court uh, faced in either instance, whether Mohammed Ismail Farooqi or the Ayodhya judgment of 2019. But we see that this kind of issue is coming up again in a different context. In the context of the Gyanwapi mosque in Varanasi. I mean, even that issue is now coming through the judiciary. Do you sense that instead of giving quietus to battles over religious sites, this might actually prompt further uh, such disputes? You are right. The situation is uh, rife with the potential of expansive ambitions, expansive ambitions of sentiments. But they have to be dealt with. Dealt with these matters are now it's a crucial stage where the judiciary must take a firm stand on, uh, on some of these issues. What was your uh, thinking on the Places of Worship Act, which puts, uh, you know... A, a it was an acknowledgement of the historical evolution of Indian predicaments. It is unique for some of the countries where this kind of uh, historic... For example, some of the Jain temples, Buddhist temples, Hindu temples, is not confined to Islamic and Hindu, this thing. Hundreds of these things. And there's one temple in Karnataka where the... The mosque is in the first floor, the Shiva temple is in the ground floor. How do you deal with that place of worship? That's right. And I think uh, understanding this complexity of uh, India's history, and which is why something like the Places of Worship Act acknowledges... To make it uh, legally adjudicable uh, issues is an oversimplification of the great social and political uh, complexities of society. It's a reflection of the immense, irreconcilable conflicts of Indian, so Indian society. And uh, just on, on this one uh, last note about this particular uh, judgment, did it also, in some sense, influence the composition of the bench in the SR Bombay case, where some of the governments dismissed came to court in the context of uh, the president's rule? Relationship between the two sets of... Uh, Versus the represented by the two things, it's difficult to put it on the same platform. That only says the impossible complexities of Indian political life. That's the most exciting part of it because there is a conciliable. And that's the point of conciliation, that accepting that the conciliable is the conciliation. No, and that is a very, uh, very nice way that you've put it, that conciliation doesn't mean you accept that it is all reconcilable. I remember this uh, Matthew once said, you are confronted with two realities. It is not open to you to say which is the correct, which is not. You must uh, assign it to the irreconcilabilities of life, uh, to conflicting truths. You can say which is true and which is not. It is not for you to choose. The coexistence, the reflection of the 
the mystery of life. Uh, I think he quoted from the literary supplement, uh, the English newspaper's literary supplement, Science. Science literary supplement, yes. Supplement. He quoted that. You are raising civilization issues. Eventually, in 2019, the Supreme Court of India decided the main legal case between the Hindu and Muslim parties in the Babri Masjid case. and held that the site where the babri masjid once stood should be handed over to the hindu parties the up government was directed to provide a separate plot to the muslim parties to build a mosque in the next episode we will be hearing from justice mn venkata chalaya on his early days as a lawyer his memories of bengaluru its courts and the legal profession this episode was recorded at the indian institute of world culture in bengaluru and i'd like to thank the team and staff at iiwc for making this possible i'd also like to thank my colleague at vidhi bengaluru pratiksha ulal for her research help during this podcast you have been listening to bic talks by bangalore international center if you like what you heard do follow us on social media keep up with our programming by signing up for our mailer on the website or leave us a review or rating on apple podcasts or itunes The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S Saruna Raj and Raghu Tenkaila. Artwork is designed by Channi Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu. Signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.